vast audience. I'm Dan Yutso, the managing director of the Canada United States Law Institute. This year marks the 35th anniversary of our institute. Uh, I am like the institute. Thank you. I am like the institute, also a bicentennial baby. Uh, actually, next Tuesday is my birthday. I should. Cards are accepted. Uh, but uh, as part of our over as being uh, here for three and a half decades and having a vibrant program, um, it does at time to time require a bit of a facelift. And what we've spent, we've dedicated the past decade to examining our operations, both through a strategic review of all aspects, from our structure and governance model to our programs, and lastly, our development structure. We have, I've said this morning, and others have heard me say this in other settings, that one of the greatest assets of our institute is we have the most talented legal minds on the continent, if not the world, associated with our organization. One of the great challenges when you're doing a structure and governance document is that we have some of the most talented legal minds on the continent, if not the world. So with that, but we have, with tremendous guidance from our advisory board and our executive committee, established this governance, structure and governance model for the institute that will pull, carry us forward for the decades to come. And in particular, Dick Cunningham of Steptoe & Johnson drafted our initial structure and operational guidelines back in 2006. And with a few years of experience, changes in the institute, changes at our academic institute, institutions, it, it required a little bit of polish as well. And Michael Robinson uh, gladly carried the mantle. I don't, I'm, I'm, gladly may be an exaggeration, but uh, a little bit. But Michael Robinson uh, did the heavy lifting in terms of, of carrying this forward with the active support of our national directors, Professor Michael Scharf, our U.S. director here at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and Kai Carmody, from the, our Canadian director from the University of Western Ontario. You'll be hearing more from Michael and Kai later this evening. Our, great, our heritage rests in having our home in two academic institutions. And those of you that have, att have attended a faculty meeting or two over the years know that that's not always such a great thing, but um, de dealing with two very different academic institutions. But it's also our, our heritage. It's, it renders Coosley unique and extraordinary in terms of the activities we provide in three ways. First, it provides us with stability and reputation. These are prestigious academic institutions. Thirdly, everything we do is inherently bilateral, and you can see that reflected in this room. And as I stated earlier, we have students both in this room and in our overflow rooms and watching via webcast from Case Western and the University of Western Ontario. They should be studying for finals, but that, that's, an, that's a whole other issue. And lastly, we are nonpartisan, and as you've seen on our panels, that this is, you will hear all sides of these Canada-US issues, so it's not an industry association viewpoint or the view of one government, et cetera. It also gives us the opportunity to expose successive generations of law students to the, this special Canada-United States relationship. And we, as I look around the room, there's many alumni of this program here today that when, of course, they go on to bigger and better things, uh, I think one only needs to walk into the U.S. Department of Homeland Security right now and see it across the room, our students, graduates, alumni of our program. And you'll see that even more so tonight when Admiral Parks is here from the United States Coast Guard. So, but. And you'll, you'll notice uh, as part of our, our legacy as well isn't just here at the law school. You'll see later this afternoon we build relationships across our campus with the Great Lakes Energy Institute over at our School of Engineering, with the Weatherhead School of Management uh, right next door, about 50 yards away, and a number of other of our programs. One of my favorite stories is I teach Canada U.S. legal relations, and the, the, the areas on Quebec are a little bit challenging for me as an American to teach Quebec. And uh, Mark Boucher, our, the, the governmental representative of Quebec in Chicago, I gave him a buzz. He likes to lecture. I said, hey, come teach our class. Can you teach this? And they can hear from a Quebecois. And, and Mark, Mark came into the class, and uh, I said, Mark, I'll build a program for you. And he said, I'd really love to get to know the Francophone program at Case Western Reserve. You have one of the best around. And I said, sure. And I hung up the phone and went, we have a Francophone program at Case Western <laughs> Reserve. Uh, but of course, it's, uh, now we've developed a partnership with our College of Arts and Sciences where our students, particularly those that go on exchange programs, can then uh, get boned up on French, so to speak, uh, through that program as well. So it is a collaborative environment. At the University of Western Ontario, as Ian will touch on in just a moment, uh, they've launched a, a university-wide Canada-US Institute to really leverage this asset that we possess here at our law schools. And that leadership starts at the top. 
Uh, we are just for extremely fortunate to have two great deans leading the charge. Dean, who I believe is still the longest serving dean in Canada at the University of Western Ontario. And we've been quite fortunate. I am an alum of this law school and we've been blessed in many ways uh, to have Interim Dean Bob Rawson come to the law school and bring his experience and expertise over the past several years. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dean Rawson who will make a few remarks and then we'll sign our structure and operational guidelines. Thank you, Dan, and <clears throat> thank you all. If, if Ian is the longest serving Canadian dean, I may be the most temporary of U.S. deans, but I've been <clears throat> honored and privileged to be the interim dean here for some time now and to have been involved with this conference a couple of times already. It's my pleasure on behalf of our law school to add my welcome to all of you uh, scholars, business leaders, uh, government officials uh, and practicing lawyers who participate with this, uh, this important conference. We're delighted to have you here and, and delighted to be able to, uh, to, ho to host this, this event. I want to add a special welcome to my colleague Ian. It's delightful to have, have him here representing the partnership that has long existed between Western Ontario and, and, uh, and Case Western Reserve. And I want to also add my welcome to Kai. Uh, who is the Canadian director, and our thanks to Michael Scharf, who uh, ha handles that on, on behalf of the United States side of, side of the equation. And of course, in, and in welcoming and thanking both of them, there's a large staff and support mechanism and group that stands behind them in, su in supporting the work of, of, uh, of Coosley. I also want to add my welcome particularly to the executive committee of Coosley and to the advisory board uh, who, who, who are here. We are grateful to you for your adding your energy and your expertise, and a particular welcome to Governor Blanchard and to the Honorable James Peterson, who are leading that, that effort at, uh, at, at this point. <clears throat> it was the inspiration of one of our emeritus law professors here at Case Western Reserve, Sidney Picker, I think, who made a proposal that there be an organization like this uh, in 1976. And since that time, this organization, Coosley, has made it possible for students on both sides of the border to study in, in real depth what is the most important bilateral relationship in the world that is between the Canada and the United States. And that has been done through courses, through exchanges and, and internships, <coughs> through the the Niagara International Moot Court Competition, and through conferences, the most important of which each year is, uh, is, is this one. So we are, we are delighted that this tradition continues, and delighted also that the effort has been put in by many of you in the room that Dan has already alluded to, that is the updating of the governing guidelines that, that govern this important organization. And I want to add my thanks to Dick Cunningham and to Michael Robinson for their particular contributions to getting, to getting this done. Uh, I have reviewed the guidelines. I want you to know I'm a careful lawyer. I don't sign something that I haven't read. And I think it's a wonderful roadmap for guiding this organization uh, into, into the future. And I will happily endorse and sign these guidelines in just a few minutes. But now let me turn the podium over to my esteemed colleague, Ian, Ian for his remarks. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, thanks for, for your kind words and thanks for your continued hospitality. Uh, today's an important day, but, but for, for Bob and I, it's important in a poignant way uh, because this is the last time that both of us will be attending uh, this conference in our, present, in our present capacities. We're both uh, um, halfway out the door in terms of our, in terms of our deanship. Uh, and in that vein, let me, let me echo uh, what Dan said and say that this has been a long, th this project of revitalizing the, what I'll describe as sort of the legal guts of the organization has been a project of long standing. And at least on the Canadian side, it began um, in August of 2000, shortly after I, I arrived at in my current job. Uh, I had a lunch meeting in, at the University Club in Toronto with with Michael Robinson and Larry Herman and Jim McElroy, and that began the discussion for, for the document that we're about, to, we're about to sign this afternoon. I, uh, I 
been privileged to do a lot of things uh, uh, during my time as, as dean at Western. It's, uh, you know, come what may, I have no doubt that this is going to be the highlight of my, my professional career. Um, but I can say uh, with conviction that I've done nothing, nothing more important uh, than, than lend support to this institute. You know, in Canada, we, we, we are wedded to a, a description of ourselves as two solitudes, and that, that expression is usually used to describe uh, the French and English-speaking populations of Canada. But I've, I've always thought that the expression is equally apt to describe the relations between most Canadians and most Americans. Um, at one level, it's more understandable uh, to describe the relations between French-speaking and English-speaking Canadians because we can't, one under can't understand one another. Um, but it's not at all excusable, I don't think, um, for, for two peoples um, sprung from the same constitutional root uh, whose histories uh, and economies uh, uh, and societies are so, so deeply intertwined um, to be walking around in such blissful ignorance of the realities of, uh, of the other. And that's why I think that this institute is just so terribly, terribly important in that it brings together academics, lawyers, um, politicians, business people, um, um, uh, the people of influence from, from virtually every, the media, from people of influence from vir virtually every walk of life. And, uh, and truly, to the extent that I'm proud of anything uh, in my time as Dean of Law at Western, it's the support that I've given to, to Coosley. So, uh, so thank you very much. And publicly, I want to acknowledge the debt that I owe to my colleague, uh, Kai Carmody. Thank you. So, uh, Dan, uh, Bob, I guess uh, you're ready to sign. Just, uh, you Last chance to back out. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about what it says. What, what, yeah, yeah, don't worry about what it says. Thank you. So at this time, we'll continue with our program. I just have to laugh. I wonder what the chip bags sound like on the webcast, uh, because from the front of the room, the, the acoustics in here are interesting. So with that, I'll invite Al Monaco, our speaker, and Jamie Spence to come down. And as they're coming to the podium, or to the, to the stage, I should say, uh, just a few reminders as people have been coming in and out. Uh, this event, as I've mentioned, is being webcast. Um, when during the Q&A, please ensure that you use the microphones here so that uh, so that they can hear you through the recordings. For those of you that need to take afternoon Blackberry breaks, those types of things, the event, there is an overflow room right across, right next to where you received your lunch. Uh, please feel free to go in there. It's a less formal environment. You'll see our students are kind of hanging out in there. So please feel free to, to do that so you can kind of keep abreast of what's happening. Here you'll also see in the break area, it is on display as well on, on one of our monitors, which is a, 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 some of the technology investments that we've made here at Case Western. And also, please keep in mind that everything is on the record, so to speak. Uh, so when you do approach the podium, as others have, or the microphones, uh, please state your name and affiliation. And because these uh, are more than just uh, recorded, they are published in the Canada United States Law Journal, and we want to have a record of that as well. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jamie who in turn will introduce Al Monaco. Thank you. Let me clean up our mess. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Jamie Spence. I'm a uh, partner in the Toronto office of Dickinson Wright, and I've got the pleasure today to introduce our keynote luncheon speaker, Mr. Al Monaco. Al is president, Gas Pipelines, Green Energy, and International for Anbridge, Inc., out of Calgary. This business unit is responsible for the operation and growth of Enbridge gas pipelines, including its gas gathering and processing operations in the United States, their Gulf Coast offshore assets, and Enbridge's investment in Alliance Vector and Osabo. Al also has responsibility for Enbridge's green power generation in North America, its energy marketing business, international business development, and investment activities. Al earned a Master of Business Administration Finance from the School of Business at the University of Calgary. He holds a certified management accounting designation. 
and is a member of the Society of Management Accountants of Alberta. Al recently completed the Advanced Management Program at Harvard. To draw a line from this morning, um, given Al's accounting background, I think he may have a greater personality than the economists. <laughs> Please uh, welcome Al Monaco. Al? Well, I'm not sure about that last comment, but I'll try and live up to it, I guess. Uh, when I was asked to speak at this conference, it literally took me about three seconds to say yes. That's partly because Enbridge is an important player in the energy equation on both sides of the border, but it's also because I truly find the Canada-U.S. relationship a fascinating one. Uh, it's unique on many levels, and I really do enjoy talking uh, and speaking with Canadians and Americans about it. Recent developments in the Middle East and North Africa have shown the volatility of oil supply and oil prices, which reinforces that the interconnectedness of the Canada-U.S. energy system is really a strategic advantage to both nations. So that interconnectedness shows up in the facts and figures uh, of the energy trade, but there's also, I think, some clouds lurking on the horizon here, which is going to challenge the relationship going forward. Now, I have, uh, I wasn't sure about slides today because it is a keynote, but when you're talking about energy, uh, it's always useful to show a few maps to get a, a picture and a feel for the continental um, uh, outlook here. I like to focus my comments on the overall energy picture in North America from a corporate perspective. You've heard of a lot of different perspectives here so far, which have been very interesting. So what I'll do is discuss the importance of energy in our economy and the criticality of the resources that flow across the border. Describe our company's role uh, in that energy flow and what we're doing to develop infrastructure that goes to the heart of energy security and economic growth. And then wrap up with I what I believe are a few important challenges and opportunities facing Canada and U.S. in terms of policymakers and our industry. I hope the main message, though, that I leave today uh, is one that says the future growth and sustainability of our standard of living in North America depend on the strength of the Canada-U.S. energy relationship and that we need to manage and nurture that relationship going forward. Before I get to that, though, um, you know, once you get up here, you can say what you want. So uh, this, is, uh, this is an area that uh, I'm going to take a few minutes on, which is really my personal view uh, on how Canadians see themselves day to day and the relationship that they have uh, with the United States. And Canadians might appreciate this. Uh, we'll have to see about the Americans, but this is um, sort of how I look at uh, this dynamic. Believe it or not, some Canadians feel unsure about themselves in this relationship. On the other hand, nobody questions that Canadians can be speak, uh, speak up and be counted on. At times, we differ with U.S. positions, witness our cross-border issues around beef, softwood, lumber, and so on. But we usually work through those. We sometimes feel that Canada has a very small role, or a smaller role anyway, on the world stage compared to the United States. But we believe strongly in our values, and we think we punch well above our weight when it comes to standing up for those va values, in many cases, right alongside our American friends. I'd venture to say that most Canadians feel that their national sport, hockey, is much more exciting than baseball, basketball, or NASCAR. But we're too polite to even say that to an American. <laughs> Interestingly, um, uh, when I speak to my U.S. friends and colleagues, they really have trouble understanding this whole dynamic I'm talking about here. Uh, and that, that's an inferiority complex that uh, it seems to be part of our psyche. Well, it might have something to do with living alongside the 5,000-pound elephant, which just happens to be the world's economic and military superpower. So it's got to have some psychological effect uh, at some point, and, and after this, this will be the last uh, psychoanalysis I'm going to attempt during this conversation, especially for an accountant. So when it comes to energy, though, I'm, cost I'm contrasting now that initial view to energy. We come all the way out of the shell, and we believe Canada is second to none in terms of searching for, 
uh, developing and producing energy of all forms. We have the technical skills to develop these resources, although we are smart enough to know the benefits uh, with the free flow of talent, technology, and capital across the border. And of course, as you see on the slide here, Canada has massive energy resources, which positions us to become an energy superpower. Canada has the second largest crude reserves of crude oil at 178 billion barrels, and the ultimate reserve potential is somewhere past 300 billion. Now, in 2009, Canada provided 90 percent of all U.S. natural gas imports. We also share, as you know, an integrated electricity grid and supply virtually all of each other's electricity imp uh, imports. And finally, on this point, over the last decade as Canadians, we've discovered, uh, I think what it is, uh, a newfound confidence that our economic model actually works. And on that point, our banks uh, weathered uh, the uh, financial collapse very well. In fact, uh, wor the World Economic Forum now ranks Canada as the strongest banking uh, system in the world. The IMF ranks Canada with the lowest debt to GDP. You can see that on the left there. And on the right, total employment has increased rapidly, with most new jobs uh, coming from full-time areas in high-wage industries. Canada, no doubt, then, is in a strong position, but the reality behind that is a lot of it has to do with our energy as a significant part of our economy. So that's my quick analysis on the Canadian psyche and, and when it comes to our place in the world alongside the United States. Energy is an important part of our economic engine, which means that the energy relationship between us is equally important. Trade between the two countries on energy totals $88 billion. Canada exports 2 million barrels every day of crude oil to the United States and 330 billion cubic feet of natural gas monthly. Right here in Ohio, the biggest import uh, from Canada is energy at $4 billion. Oil sands investments over the next decade are going to be in the order of $200 billion at least. That uh, is actually a number that came uh, to us prior to the uh, down, uh, as we were moving through the downturn. That is estimated to generate about 300,000 jobs in the United States through spin-off benefits and upwards of 30 to $40 billion in increased GDP in the United States over the next decade. So now I'm going to turn to our role in the North American uh, energy chain. And I think we bring a, a unique continental perspective here as we're focused on both sides of the border. On the left uh, top there, we operate the world's longest crude oil system. And uh, that puts through about 2 million barrels per day of crude. On the right, we own Canada's largest gas utility with 2 million customers. Bottom left, we bring natural gas and gas products, importantly, I'll talk about that in a minute, to the Chicago market. On the Gulf Coast, again on the bottom left, we have an extensive gathering and processing business which positions us to capitalize on the gas growth, and I'm going to touch on that one a little later on. We also move uh, about 40% of offshore deep gas. Finally, we recently added a new platform, and that's on the bottom right including wind, solar, and waste heat recovery. There are environmental benefits of adding this platform, but the strategy uh, is also driven by the need to sustain our earnings and growth in the longer term. And in a way, uh, this is a bit of a microcosm, I think, of, of uh, my overall view on this, in that uh, we need to transition uh, to, to green energy over time, and, and you can see that that's being a part of our strategy here at Enbridge as well. Now, this slide illustrates the uh, sheer scale and scope of our liquids pipelines business, connecting growing Canadian supply with the very important U.S. Pad 2 refining market in the Midwest. Now, I think I counted Keystone, uh, Keystone's name about seven or eight times or maybe more, but uh, we already move about 70% of all the crude oil out of Western Canada, and Canada provides 21% of all U.S. imports, and that's the most of any country. That's very likely to grow uh, for a number of factors I'll get into. In fact, uh, the President recently reinforced the importance of security of supply 
and Canada's role in his recent statements. And I can assure you there was a lot of uh, Canadians looking uh, very carefully uh, at his comments. I want to briefly cover a, a project here that best exemplifies the power of the Canada-U.S. energy relationship. And, you know, sometimes corporately we talk about synergies. And uh, I think that word is often used, but in loose terms to us what it means, can you get one and one and somehow add that up to three? And I think this is a good example of that. The development of the Canadian oil sands, as you know, has resulted in a significant increase in oil production. Our goal was to get the product to the U.S. market and at the same time find a way to find a new market for those refined product, products, which are the Canadian oil sands. To that uh, end, we developed the Alberta Clipper project, which is the one that's uh, highlighted here in blue. It runs, of course, from west to east. And then we created a, a return line. That's the red one that works from uh, east to west here to return that refined product so it can be blended to help the transportation of the heavy crude. So you can see here this is uh, more or less a virtually closed system that really is focused on supporting growth of security and supply but also growth for both Canada and the US. And by the way I included this photo here because it commemorates the point at which the Clipper pipeline crosses <coughs> the Canada-US border. So this is the time of construction. I had this, uh, and it actually hangs in the uh, back of my office wall here. I just thought I would uh, show you uh, in a way to illustrate uh, the cooperative nature of the relationship. One of the most prolific plays in North America is the Bakken oil shale. I'm sure you've all heard of it. The Bakken has large reserves, somewhere in the order of six to seven billion barrels. The crude is very high in quality, uh, ultralight with very low sulfur, and uh, that makes it a fantastic resource. In 2010, we completed expansions on both sides of the border, and we're now building a further 325,000 barrels a day at a cost of some 600 million. So this is a great example of how borders don't matter in our business, and the winners here are going to be U.S. producers in that that crude will now be able to get to market. A key element of what we do is ensuring that there's enough pipeline capacity to reach U.S. markets. The red arrow here depicts our strategy to move barrels into the Gulf Coast, and that's to address a critical bottleneck in that there's a whole uh, slew of crude coming into uh, the Cushing area that needs to move out. The green arrow shows our planned extensions here to the eastern markets. Those markets are looking to diversify their sources of crude away from foreign supply. And the line to the west coast shows a proposed gateway pipeline, which is going to open up access to the Asian markets. So now let's move to some of the challenges that will need to be addressed as we work through uh, the criticality of securing energy supply. One of the key challenges going forward, uh, I believe, is, is a conflict between policy objectives and the realities of energy demand. We had a little bit of this conversation already in the last panel. Current and previous administrations have emphasized the need to reduce dependence on foreign oil, yet overall demand of oil continues to rise. U.S. oil basins are maturing, and some areas actually still remain off limits, and we saw a good map of that before. Our objective is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Yet many developing nations are going through explosive growth and industrialization of their economies, so that will be a challenge. The goal is to reduce consumption of fossil fuels, but renewable energy still requires economic support. In addition, although significant advancements have been made on wind and solar, and we know this firsthand, the fact is that they can't provide base load requirements because of their intermittent nature. This means that they need to be married up actually with uh, other forms of fuels such as natural gas and upgrades to the transmission grid. A challenge to the security of economic energy supply is the opposition we see to energy development and, and I'll say basically any kind of energy development. All forms of energy are under pressure. Oil and coal are relatively low cost but they're higher in emissions. Nuclear has zero emissions, but some question the industry's ability to manage 
the safety around it, as we've seen. Natural gas is abundant and safe, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more, but it's a fossil fuel, so there's opposition to that. Wind is green, but still experiences uh, permitting issues and concerns over birds and, and other issues like that. Solar is also green, but it's more costly right now by quite a margin. And at this point, it requires a lot more land because it has severely less energy density. Traditional sources like crude oil from Canada are going to meet um, the demand that's increasing and security of supply issues. This slide here shows the forecast supply growth coming from Canada over the next decade. And I'm not sure if you can make out the numbers there, but essentially it grows from about two and a half million barrels per day to somewhere in the range of four. And the majority of that increase comes from the oil sands. There's a high degree of confidence in this supply profile. And the reason is that it's more akin, the oil sands, to a manufacturing process compared to an exploration process that you would see, for example, on the offshore Gulf Coast. And uh, the key here is whether or not uh, we're going to have significant enough pricing in order to, uh, to uh, support development of the oil sands. Every price projection that I see uh, certainly uh, would indicate that the oil sands will be developed um, economically, especially given the improvements in technology. Now, the proximity of Canada's crude to the U.S. markets provides, I think, a real uh, sustainable competitive advantage for North America. And you've seen pipeline infrastructure on the previous maps there that, uh, that show that they're well developed and they're getting crude to market. Another cloud lurking, though, is that Canadian producers are looking to diversify their markets and accessing Asia-Pacific demand, and that's the, the one arrow I showed off the west coast of Canada. Now, that only makes sense because none of us in this room would want to be a price taker because we only have one market as Canada is at this point. Now, another cloud looming, and uh, the map of Florida was actually referred to a little while ago here. Uh, another cloud that's been hovering is that the oil sands probably has not done a good enough job in addressing public concerns, although in some cases, that's based on what I think is sensationalism and playing loose with the facts. For example, we've heard opponents describe the oil sands as the size of Florida. True. But in fact, the development area that we're talking about is only 2% of Florida. Equally important, mining accounts for only about half of the production, whereas other forms of production, in my view, at least are less benign. Another misconception is that the oil sands generate vastly higher emissions. In fact, when you look at the emissions from the plant all the way to the tailpipe, oil sands are only about 6% more intensive than the average U.S. crude, and very similar, in fact, and in some cases lower than heavy crudes from California and Venezuela. So we need to remember that the vast majority of emissions, about 80%, are actually generated by end-use consumption. So that's really the area that we need to focus on. Danielle is right that there is still more that needs to be done. Uh, I fully agree with that comment. And the industry, though, I think has, in fairness, made progress. GHG emissions associated with every barrel of oil sands has been reduced by 39% since 1990. More than 85% of the water used in the oil sands uh, is now recycled. And that water is actually not fresh water. It's, uh, from uh, lower, lower aquifers under the formations. In terms of tailings that was referred to, technology advancements, I think, are being made. And we've actually seen the first reclamation uh, of that happen back in September of last year. Progress uh, we've heard on, on sequestration has been, has been made as well. Um, the government of Alberta is actually uh, going to invest $2 billion to further develop that. But let's not kid ourselves here. Carbon capture, capture sequestration at this point is not economic uh, unless we see much higher imputed costs of carbon. In addition to communication around the facts, there are other important factors that need to be considered in this whole issue about where you get your crude. And the quality of regulatory oversight in Canada I feel is exceptionally strong, and we've lived through it for a number of years, including stringent environmental, uh, community, and First Nations processes. But I think perhaps the most important uh, point of all is that crude oil 
and other forms of energy supplied by Canada come with a shared set of values with the United States. That means human rights, democracy, uh, rule of law, open markets, and of course, a focus on the environment. I want to uh, spend a little bit of time on natural gas. This slide really uh, illustrates how the story for natural gas has changed dramatically in just four years. Now, four years is the term of uh, a presidential uh, term, but it's not very long in the energy business. The black line that you see here shows the supply outlook that we had for gas back in 2006. At the same time, uh, then we were projecting a flat supply of about 70 BCF per day and that assumed Alaska gas was coming in as well as some LNG imports. We now see gas reaching 90 BCF per day, predominantly because of the shale contribution, with no contribution from Alaska during the period you see here. In fact, what you see now is the industry is considering actually exporting natural gas off the Gulf Coast uh, as well as off the west coast of Canada. So this has been nothing short, I think, than a remarkable turnaround. And a key part of that has to do with the improvements in technology, and particularly on the drilling side, which makes it economic to drill many gas reservoirs at a price of gas in the range of 4 to $5. And that's exactly why prices are where they are today. The importance of natural gas, uh, I think, in our future cannot be overemphasized. Um, we've heard uh, some comments around this being a transitional fuel and some uncertainty around where it's going to fit. Um, I think, in my view, natural gas is really going to be a linchpin uh, of energy security in North America. The advantages of natural gas are, are very clear and compelling. North American reserves are massive, and the abundance of supply makes gas cost-effective against other fuels. Natural gas is very responsive to demand, and li I like to think of it as being able to turn on the drilling tap at will uh, in order to respond to supply situations and demand. Many prolific shale gas plays are very rich in natural gas liquids, which provides a very important source of value. The cost effectiveness of those products allows both Canada and the United States to be very competitive on the global scale as far as exporting uh, feedstock for petrochemical use that produces plastics and other products. So in a way, we are already exporting natural gas. And finally, natural gas is not green, and uh, it's not clean per se, but it is much um, uh, cleaner to burn than other fuels. Now, one last point at the risk of belaboring this, this uh, issue, if there's one thing that we know about the economies uh, in, in our uh, continents, uh, Canada, the United States, is that electricity demand is going to continue to grow. As was noted, a key source of supply for electric power, power generation in the coming years will be natural gas. And you can see by the white line here that has the uptick, uh, there's going to be a significant increase in gas consumption for electricity. But and I think this may have been mentioned as well, there's another broader point here with this chart, which is that we're going to need all of the sources of energy to meet electricity demand. We're not going to have the luxury of being able to pick and choose what we want. So there's a lot of opposition to this fuel or that fuel, but the reality is we need it all. And that includes renewables uh, to power our economy down the road and maintain our standard of living in the future. So let me summarize uh, quickly here with a few uh, key takeaways. Energy plays, um, as you've heard, a significant role in our lives, and I think it's a pillar of the Canada-U.S. trading relationship. Crude oil is going to be a key driver of both Canada and the U.S. economies. And for all the reasons I mentioned, Canada plays a significant role in stable and reliable supply. In Enbridge, uh, our company plays an important part of that in making sure supply gets uh, to the market to, uh, to support refinery uh, production and so forth. Gas is going to be critical uh, to energy fuel uh, our economies in the future, uh, and it's not, in my view, just a transitional fuel. North America is well 
very well developed and endowed with natural gas, and I think we need to start looking at natural gas as a strategic fuel. As we transition to a less carbon intensive economy, our energy supply and renewable energy must grow as well to help meet that demand. On the policy side, we all know that a number of groups uh, that have varied interests have called for different energy uh, strategies for Canada and the U.S. Uh, policy gaps aside, and, and there's a lot of policy experts already in this room, uh, I'd suggest that any Canadian, U.S. or continental approaches that we take emphasize certainty and responsiveness. And by certainty, I mean we need consistency and clarity from regulators and governments so that we can make investment decisions to move forward. My number one rule in our business is that um, certainty encourages investments, but if we are in an uncertain environment, we certainly are <coughs> discouraged from investing. From an industry perspective, decisions by regulators and others on existing and potential infrastructure should be driven by a balanced and timely assessment of the benefits of risks of a given project. From a continental perspective, though, uncertainty poses significant barriers to our energy relationship and could risk uh, the economic security and supply security in North America. A significant part of the onus of a successful energy strategy rests with people like myself and others in the energy industry. We need to show uh, leadership in terms of uh, climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. For example, uh, although we are not a major emitter, uh, we are uh, proud to say that uh, we're committed to stabilizing our own environmental footprint. In fact, in 2009, our own direct emissions were 23 percent below 1990 levels, and that happened at a time when crude oil production actually increased by 45 percent. We also implemented a recent neutral footprint strategy, which basically says that any new uh, project that we bring forward will be environmentally neutral. Neutral. Finally, I think the, the industry, as I mentioned before, needs to do a better job of telling individuals, families, communities about the connection between energy uh, and our standard of living. We seem to miss the connection uh, between uh, what it takes to produce energy and the, the gas pedal of our car, our computer, uh, and our air conditioners and so forth. So we need to take a step back in uh, working with governments and others in building uh, a better base of energy literacy. Let me uh, conclude here, and I, and I cannot conclude without showing a picture of pipeline construction. If you are in the pipeline business, this is what you do. Uh, so this is what I'm going to end with. Let me conclude then by saying that the future growth and our standard of living for all of us um, is dependent on the strength of the Canada-U.S. energy trading relationship. Let's not under underestimate its impact and let's uh, capitalize on the relationship that we have. So I think in a nutshell, going back to the earlier cartoon, uh, the mouse and the elephant uh, really need to cooperate on energy. So I really thank you for your time and uh, willing to take questions. Any questions for Al? I think you've answered all their questions. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll be happy to ask you. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned finding alternative markets but you passed over it very quickly. Would you like to expand on that? Sure. I, I think the basis uh, for that uh, statement is that in order for uh, producers to maximize the value of their resource, um, we need to have access uh, to them for, uh, for other um, uh, ways to get the crude out. And the simple premise is that if you've only got access to one market, that's going to constrain your, your ability to get the maximum price. Uh, so what we're uh, thinking of, there's a, probably a two or three pronged uh, strategy to that. Uh, a lot of it has to do with further movement of crude oil into the U.S. markets. Right now, you've got a bit of a constraint uh, in Cushing and other areas. 
Uh, but as I said, in order to maximize price, you've got to push it further south. In addition to that, um, the demand, if you look at demand uh, in, in a global sense, uh, about, um, I would say, well, a good chunk of demand uh, is going to take place in Asia Pacific. Uh, Asia Pacific region is um, uh, expected to grow by about 3.5% per year uh, in terms of crude oil consumption growth. So that's obviously a market that uh, uh, Canadian producers are looking at um, uh, getting to. And, and uh, as I said, that will uh, give them an alternative and, and hopefully maximize price for them. On precisely that point, I'm Michael Robinson from Baskin Martineau in Toronto. Um, <coughs> this is a, a, a lawyer's question, so you may not want to answer it, but uh -oh. somebody else may. Uh, <laughs> there's an, there's an, uh, an interesting section in the North American Free Trade Agreement, number 605A, which guarantees, with a small g, a certain proportionality in energy exports to the U.S. in perpetuity, as long as that treaty's around. Okay, so you build the Northern Gateway, the Asian market's booming like mad, they want to buy it. You can't sell it if it violates the proportionality obligation to the U.S., as I read that section. Have, have you considered that at all? Does that enter into the economics of uh, Northern Gateway? Well, for sure, um, we've looked at that, um, at, at the agreement and the provisions of that. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, there's nothing to preclude uh, producers from accessing alternative markets. And uh, once again, it's based on the principle of um, uh, being able to, to, to maximize price. And, and in this case, um, you know, I don't think the NAFTA ever intended for uh, Canadian crew to be mispriced relative to the world market. So um, uh, that would be my view on it. Hi, my name is Ryan Scott, uh, Consumer Energy Alliance. I was curious, have you ever, uh, is there anything holding Canadians back or, or Canada in general back from refining these products in the country? There's been some talk about, well, if you can't, if Keystone XL doesn't happen, or just the way things are now, why not just refine it, make more money, sell it at a higher price? Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question. I think uh, in Canada, there's always a view that um, it would be a good idea to certainly refine crude or upgrade crude even, which is sort of halfway there, uh, in that it would retain the value in Canada. The reality is that there's excess refining capacity right now in the United States. And uh, the difference in cost between uh, creating a new upgrading facility or refinery uh, in Canada versus utilizing existing capacity in the United States is quite substantial. It's about a five to one margin. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's a good objective uh, in order to increase value within the country from the product, uh, but the reality is it's much more cost effective to use existing capacity. Al, you mentioned, uh, Jim Blanchard again for the uh, record. You, you mentioned the importance of regulatory certainty, and that would be both in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, do you have any other thoughts, though, in terms of the, the title of our conference, which is, the question is, do we need or should we have a Canada-U.S. common approach to climate change? Any thoughts on that? You know, I, th I think the obvious response would be, um, you know, we should have the same policy. And I think our government has uh, espoused that view that we would follow uh, what the United States um, uh, proposes to do. Um, I, I do think we have to think very carefully about that, though, because our economies are different. And I think our um, uh, a policy on climate change needs to be uh, focused on our specific situation. Uh, so I would say, uh, Governor, that uh, I think we need to take a little bit more time uh, and figure out whether or not we need our own independent uh, view on climate change initiatives. Uh, David Crane, I want to come back to this issue of refining in Canada. Right. From the Canadian perspective, it's very important. 
And uh, to what extent are we just hostage, because some American investors happen to own some refineries which they would like to fill with our crude, versus what is in our best interest? And uh, surely we could at least be making some kind of start to upgrading uh, this resource in our own country. Otherwise, we're just like the Australians. We're digging stuff out of the ground, shipping it out of the country, capturing minimum value out of it. It's not a very forward-looking policy, I don't think, for, can for Canada. Well, I think that's uh, principally the, the argument uh, that supports our move for Northern Gateway, which is to access the Asia-Pacific market with enough pipeline capacity that uh, would make a difference. So I agree with uh, the premise, and that's what's behind uh, Northern Gateway. Um, I, I do think, though, I wouldn't over-necessarily play the, the uh, I think you said something like minimal value. Uh, I do think the, uh, the crude is getting uh, a, a decent value at the moment. Uh, the question is, uh, is it getting maximum value? And uh, our analysis shows that uh, with Northern Gateway, uh, the, the net back uh, price uh, to Western Canadian producers would be increased by somewhere in the order of two to three dollars a barrel. Doesn't sound like much, but uh, remember that um, uh, all this works on, on, on marginal pricing so that if you access a new market that has a higher price, that higher price applies to all the barrels. So when you look at all the math behind that, somewhere in the order of $28 billion of additional revenue um, uh, to Western Canadian producers from uh, accessing that new market. So that's part of what's behind uh, interest for that project. I will also say that um, the impact uh, on Canada as a whole of, of doing a project like Gateway uh, comes with huge uh, spin-off benefits, both direct and indirect, uh, huge uh, uh, improvements in tax revenues, both locally uh, and nationally. And uh, the GDP effect that we see from Gateway uh, over the next uh, uh, two decades is somewhere in the order of $270 billion. So from a national perspective, uh, I think uh, it makes sense as well. My name's Jim McElroy. You showed a chart showing the reserves of the, the oil sands, and a couple of quick questions. Um, are you having to dig deeper to get at it, or spend more to bring it out? And secondly, is the quality of the uh, bitumen as you as you continue to exploit it is it going down, and therefore your your costs relatively are rising? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, your first question was on cost, right? The cost of yes, I, I mean you have to dig deeper. Right, right. Um, uh, have you? Thank have you. you have yeah. you taken basically all the low-hanging fruit at this point, and now it's going to get a lot more expensive? Uh, I wouldn't describe it that way. I think the mining extraction process uh, is still at the point where it's extending uh, the current uh, uh, zone, if you will. Uh, right now, that zone is down to 200, 200 meters. And then, um, uh, so beyond that, uh, other types of uh, extraction methodologies are used as uh, steam assisted gravity dra drainage is probably uh, the most prominent one. I would say that uh, overall um, the finding and development cost, let me put it that way, of oil sands is somewhere in the order of fifty to sixty dollars per barrel on a full cycle basis and that includes the return of capital, return on capital, all the costs and so forth. So you probably need somewhere in the order of sort of that fifty, sixty, sixty-five dollar range. Uh, if anything, we've seen the costs uh, become more uh, efficient going going forward here, simply because of the improvements in the technology. So I don't see uh, a significant increase in costs at all uh, from from oil sands development because of uh, having to go deeper, if you will. On the quality side, uh, once again, I, I think um, uh, the crude is very homogenous. And uh, I think until we uh, sort of um, go beyond the barriers of those reserves there, I think the quality is not being degraded uh, substantially at this point. Any further questions? Okay. Thank you, Al. Thank you. We're going to take a five-minute health break. Also, I noticed stuff in front of you, so if you want to 
pitch that out to. But we'll be back in about 